So I think personally, an amazing project would be if you're, let's say you're a travel photographer or a travel filmmaker, like, a, you know, somebody who does documentaries or you're interested in do, doc, doing documentaries or, or you're interested in doing important, meaningful work. I think an amazing project would be to go to Kenya and to speak to the Samburu people who are native to that part of the world and talk about their relationship to elephants and how elephants are so close to being human to them and they'll talk about how elephants have eyelashes that are very similar to human beings and how intelligent they are and maybe do a documentary about the poaching that goes on in that part of the world and, and how elephants are endangered because of that because people are illegally hunting them for their ivory and just murdering them you know young elephants that would be an incredible project so you know maybe that's a good project for say a Sony FX 30 you know maybe APS-C is good for that because you get a long reach and maybe you can get shots of the animals in the landscape but you don't have to get that close because you have a pretty good reach um, and you know it's small and lightweight and you can carry it around that might be an excellent project for a Sony FX 30 or maybe an amazing project if you have like I don't know say a Panasonic S5 Mark II with the good autofocus because you know that might help you with your you know kind of running around maybe you go to a place like Canada and talk to people who've been affected by the wildfires and how you know they have experienced the loss of their home or even worse the loss of lives you know and then maybe you know take a trip and go from Canada and go all the way down through the United States through upstate New York and maybe all the way down to New York City and talk to people who are affected by the air quality during those crazy wildfires this past summer I mean I think that would be a really interesting story and you know maybe you do that with the Panasonic S5 Mark II or the Mark II X which is a little bit better for filmmaking Personally, I use the Panasonic S5 because I'm used to working without autofocus. I, I actually enjoy manually focusing. And so, you know, it just kind of makes me feel like I'm more part of the process. So, yeah, or you know what? Maybe take a trip to California. Say, go to a place like Montecito, you know, near Santa Barbara, and talk to people who, you know, were maybe victims of mudslides after all the rain a couple of years ago, and people who lost their homes and lost lives you know and maybe you go out there with like the Sony A6700 maybe that's a good choice for that camera it's light could run around could interview a lot of people I think maybe the FX30 is better because you could get the the XLR add-on and get better audio I don't I'm not sure if you could use that with the uh, 60, A6700 but I don't think so but that would be a great project for the A7S3 too you know, or the GH5, you know, because micro four thirds give you even greater reach. Do you really need that, you know, tiny little depth of field for a project like that? I mean, you know, if you're talking to, you know, somebody about poachers and you're in the middle of the jungle in Africa, or if you're up in Canada talking about the wildfires and how climate change is affecting all of us, you know, maybe you don't need that, that depth of field because you're not doing a narrative film. And maybe you need people to see what's going on behind your interviews you know maybe maybe you need to think more about your composition and the foreground and the background and you know make it make these difficult subjects turn into a beautiful project you know something magnificent that people can just enjoy while you are injecting some really important information into these people with your art I'm thinking of doing a documentary myself with the Panasonic S5 I'm thinking of doing it about the housing crisis in New York City, and it, which is connected to the immigration crisis where all these people showing up. And I happen to know some landlords who have all of these like empty apartments, right? Like hundreds and hundreds of empty apartments in the Bronx. But the city is requiring that these apartments, they're all rent controlled. And so people who've, lived in there, who've been living there for like many, many years leave 
And you know, because it's rent stabilized, they've been paying like 600 bucks a month, 750, something like that. And the apartments are a mess, right? So now they have to be renovated and be, be brought up to code. Although, you know, to me, it's like, why are they not up to code already? That's a whole nother issue, but they gotta be brought up to code, which is gonna cost a ton of money. But then there's that conundrum where, you know, the city has to deal with the rent stabilization board and they can't really raise the rent. So they have to take the burden of the entire financial hit of bringing these buildings up to code. And so the city and the landlords are fighting. And meanwhile, there are all these people out on the street who need homes and there are these empty apartments just locked up. I think it would be really interesting to do a documentary that would humanize the landlords and the rent stabilization people and talk to the people on the street. Because, you know, of course, people just hate landlords. They think they suck, you know. And, you know, I have lived with slumlords. I, I've lived in the worst of circumstances, but I've also lived in some amazing circumstances with landlords with huge hearts who have actually literally saved people's lives. You know, kept people in their homes during really difficult times like the pandemic. Like I personally know stories like that. I, I know a landlord who allowed a muralist that I know to paint these murals about, you know, empowering black women in his building. So obviously there's a lot of conservative people who are gonna walk in that building and go, I'm not living in here. This is some woke building, you know? But you know, for people like me who think like me, I'd walk in there and go like, yo, I'm, this is my home. Like, I just think it would be awesome because we're all human, you know what I mean? Like, it would be amazing to take a camera, like, you know, the Fuji X-H2S or, you know, a Canon R5C. Like, what I'm saying is, you know, pick a camera that is gonna best suit the work that you wanna do. You know, that, that feels the best to you in your hands and that, you know, doesn't necessarily have all the greatest specs but has what you need it to do. Like I, I have the original Panasonic S5, right? It's got a lot of limitations compared to the new ones. However, a lot of people like the image quality on it better than the new ones. I don't really know if that makes all that much of a difference. You know, like I'm sure they're both amazing, you know, fantastic cinema level, you know, in terms of image quality. But yeah, the autofocus sucks on this camera, but I don't care. And actually it doesn't suck. Like if I was using autofocus right now, it would be fine. It does well in a situation like this. It's just, if you needed to track things, like if you were doing a documentary about race car drivers or something like that, or skateboarders, or, you know, yeah, if you go into the jungle and you wanna track animals, you might wanna have something with better autofocus. And that's why I recommend using like a Sony camera if you wanna to go to Kenya and talk to the Samburu people. And do something that will enrich your life and enrich all of our lives really fantastic autofocus might be a great idea for a project like that. On the other hand, if I did a project like that, I'd be showing up with the Panasonic S5 because I have gotten to the point where my manual focus skills are pretty good. Like I'm kind of like an autofocus person in my body because that's the way I'm used to working. Like I could pull focus for people really well if somebody asked me to do that, but I do it great on my own too. But that's just because that's the way I'm used to working. You know, but I could also see the advantage of having amazing autofocus, you know, and just going somewhere and telling a really crucial story, something that needs to be told, something that everybody needs to hear. And see, that's the opportunity that we have as artists. You know, we have the opportunity to take these difficult things, these things that people don't like to talk about, that they, they don't want to hear about. You know, they're like, yo, I, I just can, can I just have one day in my life where I don't think about racism or, you know, xenophobia or misogyny or anti-Semitism, like, can we not talk about it for one day? And when people say that to me, because I talk about that stuff every day, when people say that to me, I say, yeah, I can take a day off because I'm a white male, but none of my friends can ever take a day off because they're people of color. And so they have to deal with stuff like that every day. So it would be awesome of me to make a documentary about something like that too, or you to do something like that. I'm actually getting ready to make a film, a short film about a Sean Bell piece that I wrote years ago. And if you don't know Sean Bell, just Google him. He was murdered in 2006 by New York City police officers. He was unarmed. He was shot 50 times. So anyway, I made a, there's a video of me running around the internet for years uh, of a performance that I did at the New York and Poets Cafe 
but I want to kind of update that this year and I'm going to do something on my own. I have a great idea to do something and I want to do it in honor of the Bell family. I'm pretty, pretty friendly with Mr. and Mrs. Bell because of that work. See, that's the thing that art can do. You know, like I, I wrote something because I was inspired by that, by that horrific event. And for me, I just thought like a family has lost a son. You know, a child has lost a father, a woman has lost her fiance. Like I, I, I just, it was hard for me to handle that. So I just wrote about it because I had to get it out of my body. Otherwise stuff like that just eats away at me and, and slowly kills me. And it became a great thing for me. You know, and I, I somehow met the Bell family. Somebody introduced me to them and it got me involved with all kinds of other stuff. And it just made my life so much more well lived than it was before that. Like it gave me more meaning, more purpose and all because of art, you know, all because of a theater piece that I did. And that's the opportunity that you have. Like, look what's going on in the Middle East right now in Gaza. How amazing would it be? Like there are people, there are like travel photographers who go to Iceland and, you know, Newfoundland and places like that. And they do these beautiful travel videos, like amazing. They look so gorgeous, you know, and it, it just inspires you to just go travel and see the world and meet different kinds of people. But, but how amazing if they took the time to go to Gaza right now right and to humanize both sides like talk to the Israelis talk to Israeli soldiers you know talk to some of the Israeli families who lost people who were brutally murdered by these terrorists but also talk to the Palestinians who have been living under under like unfathomable circumstances forever like like they're living like in prison that's what their lives are like it's a very complicated situation that the only way we can really know about it is to talk to the people who are there. It's, it's so easy for us here in the United States or in London or wherever you are. It's so easy to form an opinion. I'm Jewish. It would be easy for me to go, oh, Israel must survive. They must live. But, but see, I'm also open-minded and I'm like, yo, I don't agree with the way Israel has dealt with that part of the world at all. You know, colonization is not a good thing. I'm standing on stolen land right now in upstate New York. If you're watching this anywhere in the, in the United States, you're standing on stolen land. Have you ever thought about that? That's another documentary you could do with like, I don't know, a Sony a7 IV. Although, you know, the a7 IV, I would do more of a pictorial because it's got all those megapixels and, you know, it's like more of a photography camera. Um, you know, the Sony a7 S3 and you know, 12 megapixels, it's more for video. So I would go with a more video centric camera to do a story like that. So yeah, if you're searching, you know, it's a good idea to like learn the specs, watch Gerald Undone, like go to B&H and just hang out, you know, do a deep dive on the internet and find out all the specs of the camera. But think about what you need to create a story that you want to create and think about, you know, I just, I urge you to think about the opportunity you have as an artist to elevate all of us, to, to raise our level of understanding of different things that, you know, it's like doing documentary work is so important. In this, this spring, I'm going to join the art of documentary and I just gave them a plug. Shout out to Mark Bone, who I don't know, who's kind of like a mentor to me and he doesn't even know that because I've been studying his videos so much and I've been so inspired by the work that he does. And I want to get involved with the art of documentary, which is a, a community of people that they put together. And you know, they got courses and they teach you and, but you know, I've shot two feature films already. Like I don't need his module one of how to do the basics, but I really want to join just to be part of this community. That's it. Cause I work mostly alone and yo, it's lonely out here. It's hard to do shit on your own all the time. I want to be around people doing important work like that, people who really actually care, who understand the, the opportunity and, in my opinion, the responsibility that we have to do work that means something, that, that like I said before, that elevates us, that makes our existence better and easier in the world because it helps us grow our empathy. Empathy, right? That's everything. That's the kind of work I would encourage you to do with a Sony a6700 or a GH6 or, you know, whatever camera you want to buy. Any Fuji camera, any Canon camera. I mean, you, any camera that you buy that was made in the last 10 years is off the charts incredible. Like, if you spend anywhere from 300 to 5,000, 
you're probably getting a camera that would have cost twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars fifteen years ago, right? That's a fact. Like the capabilities and the sensor and the image quality that you can get out of pretty much any camera right now is absolutely a gift to us. You know, if you could come up with three or four hundred bucks and get a Sony A6400 and you could shoot in 4K, that's an amazing camera. But you know, you have to think like, do you need stabilization? Are you going to be running around with a gimbal or without a gimbal? Sony A6400 doesn't have any stabilization. It's really small and it's light, so you might have to get a cage and build it up and put an external monitor on it, microphone, just give it some weight so that you don't get that jittery, unprofessional look. So that's why I would recommend, I mean, I'm not trying to plug anybody, but you know, I got a Panasonic camera. Stabilization, I don't even need a gimbal. I don't even like the way a gimbal looks most of the time. It looks too smooth for me, for my taste. But you know, sometimes I use a gimbal and I have a Weeble S and it's fantastic, but yo, it ain't about that. I mean, it's fun and we love to learn about these, these tools, these creative tools that enable us to communicate and to share this work and to create community. It's really fun to have the best, the greatest, all that. But you know, I think sometimes we lose sight that you could pretty much get anything and just master it. Like take that camera, get the lenses that you need and make them a part of your body. Like just master it so that they become your eyes and your heart and your soul. You know, I shoot 99% of the work that I do with two lenses. 28 millimeters and 50 millimeters, and that's it. I got a Minolta 28 millimeter f2.8 Telesaur lens. It's an old vintage lens, and I have a Minolta 50 millimeter f1.4 Rokor. And they both kind of look like those Helios lenses, right? They got cool bokeh and stuff, but you know what? I'm shooting an f11 right now because I want you to see this old drive in movie theater that I'm standing in front of, and I love it here because there's not a lot going on, right? Like, I was going to use my anamorphic lenses, which, by the way, I could shoot anamorphic in camera. I have settings in camera for anamorphic with my Lumix S5. And by the way, you could get one of these cameras right now for less than 900 bucks, like new on MPB, because the Mark II came out and nobody wants these cameras anymore. And as soon as I get my money back together, because I've spent so much money making a feature film, I'm going to buy a second one of these, because I don't need anything. This to me is like, I, I am literally in love with this camera, literally. Like, I love it so much because of what it enables me to do. It's like, I, I consider it like one of the greatest gifts that I have ever bestowed upon myself. So anyway, I'm, I'm kind of having like an ADHD moment, but this is an old drive-in movie theater, right? And I love the way it looks. And I was going to shoot anamorphic, but I noticed that anamorphic, because of all the distortion and all of the, the uniqueness to it and the way it looks, it's better to have more stuff in the frame to take advantage of that kind of look. This kind of vast open nothingness, I think it looks better with a spherical lens, just really simple. I mean, you know, the anam anamorphic lens would look fine and it would shoot me and it would be interesting and the aspect ratio would be different and that's all cool, you know? But I chose this intentionally and that, that's the thing too. When you choose your camera, you should be intentional with why are you buying that camera and what do you plan on doing with it? And what are you gonna provide to the world? What are you gonna contribute? That's what I would think when I'm buying a camera. What are you going to contribute? Are you going to be a street photographer? Like, are you going to do weddings? And, and you know, are you going to document things that people want to keep forever? These, these valuable, precious moments that they never want to lose? Are you going to take on that kind of responsibility? Or, like I said at the beginning of this video, are you going to, like, do something, get your adventure on, and go to Kenya? And meet with the Samburu people who are supposed to be the most, like, the friendliest humans who can talk to you about this poaching stuff that's going on or go to Canada and talk about climate change that's affecting all of us, everybody, everyone. Talk to some people who own a condo in Miami and can never hope to sell it now because the water is encroaching upon these streets where pretty soon there's going to be no, no like strip where all these condos and stuff in Miami because the water table is rising just like in Manhattan. Like, there are so many amazing documentaries that you could do that it makes my head explode with inspiration thinking about the possibilities of what we can do. And it makes me feel 
like moved when I think about taking on the responsibility of doing stuff like that, telling the truth, you know, with all the misinformation, the disinformation, all the craziness, voting, all the bullshit that we have to deal with right now, social media, people believing whoever, whoever made the last post, that's what you believe. Like whatever you saw last, that's what you believe. And then you see something else and then that's what you believe. Like think about contributing to the truth. Now, who knows who's going to believe you and who's not going to believe you, but at least you know that you're putting out the truth. And the more people that do that, the better we have a chance to survive. So yeah, get a camera, but be intentional with which one you want to use and why you want to use it. Do you want an APS-C camera that gives you a little bit more reach? Smaller, lighter, cheaper, or do you want a full frame camera? You could be a little bit more creative with it. You could be much better in low light. That's a fact, right? That's why I bought this camera, because I was shooting my feature film a lot at night and so I knew I needed this camera, so I sold all my APS-C stuff because I learned on a Sony a6400. So do you want full frame? Do you want APS-C? Do you want micro four thirds where you get even more reach but less depth of field? But amazing quality. All of it is amazing quality. You can do anything with any of them. Just get something. Stop wasting your time checking on trying to find the camera that does every possible thing that you would ever think of doing because trust me when I tell you, you are not going to do every single thing that you could possibly imagine. You're probably going to find the thing that you love the most. Like maybe you're going to be a portrait person or maybe you're going to be a landscape person or real estate or whatever. And, and with any of those genres of shooting, you can find a contributing way of doing that to help us because, yo, the world's in trouble, yo. Things are bad right now, things are crazy. It's violent, it's scary, we're losing our democracy, climate change, like there's so much shit going on right now. And we as artists can really contribute to this in a good way. We can contribute in a bad way too, don't do that. Take the responsibility and be truthful. And also, speak for people who don't necessarily have a platform. You got YouTube, you got all this stuff that you could do for free. And you could, if you work hard at it, you could build your platform, get a social media following and tell the truth and do it beautifully. Take these difficult, horrible, horrific events, these scary events, these, these things that are really, you know, like making us worried about our very existence and turn them into like a beautiful bed of wildflowers. And that was a metaphor. Turn them into something beautiful that so people, so that people can receive them want to receive them and so you'll inspire dialogue and get people thinking and maybe thinking about how they can contribute and how they can help make things better. Yeah, I'm kind of running out of ideas now for this video. I just wanted to come out of here and shoot this and just encourage you to do anything. I'm using auto ISO for the first time ever. I hate it, but the sun is going in and out. It's beating on my bald head. It's probably too shiny right now. I apologize for that. When I came out here, it was really cloudy. Suddenly it's sunny. so. This is like the worst possible scenario, but I have incredible dynamic range on this camera, so maybe I'll be able to fix it in post because I am shooting in V-Log. And uh, again, I'm using 28 millimeters, uh, manual Minolta lens, using a Panasonic S5. This is an old, beautiful drive-in movie theater. Sad to me that it's not working anymore, but for some reason I just love coming here. And thanks for watching me, and thanks for watching any of my videos. And please subscribe. I would appreciate that and please hit the like button if you like this and um, I guess that's it. I got nothing else to say until next time. So have a beautiful day. All right.